Thank you. I, uh, t my name is Mark Trahant. I'm the editor of Indian Country Today, and um, I'm probably going to be the only person today who is not talking about the dress. <laughs> and of all the topics discussed, I'm the only one going to be talking about Suzanne Schoenhardjo's journalism, and so for that I'm grateful. There's always a question in Indian Country about journalism and where journalism begins and where activism goes. And in Indian country, these are not simple questions. In fact, the answers could be different depending on who you ask, the time of day, what stories you're working on. The classic journalism narrative shifts so often that a writer would have to be labeled a participant or an activist instead of an observer just because of the story. Even when the narrator is skilled at the assembly of history, the context, even the facts, then there's the writing a cohesive narrative the journalistic question then, is the story fair, does it inform, and does it serve? I can easily answer those questions when I look at the work of Suzanne Schoen Harjo. Are the stories fair? Scrupulously so. Do they inform? It's really rare to edit a story when you learn things every few paragraphs, and that's exactly what happens when you edit a Suzanne Harjo piece. We are practicing our craft in a state of wonder. And do those stories serve? It's probably the most exciting question and answer. As many of you know, Indian Country Today went dark a couple of years ago. And Suzanne, I think, may be the only voice within Indian Country Today who's worked for Lakota Times, Indian Country Today in its first incarnation, Indian Country Today Media Network, and now Indian Country Today a mobile platform. When we got started, I remember talking to Suzanne about our ideas and what kind of new kind of bu uh, building a new kind of news operation we wanted to do, and uh, mentioned there'd be no print that we would be um, cell phone based, and um, I really wanted to make sure that Suzanne was involved, and she not only did that but she quickly adapted to this new world, her way. So there are two articles of faith for every journalist. One is that we write stories, not reports, and we write things on deadline. We write them fast. So I had an idea for a quick piece, putting some data into perspective, and I asked Suzanne for a quick turn. A quick turn. She ignored me. We figured the story would exceed a thousand words. Long, but fine. Remember, this is a quick read. Suzanne said she would send it on Monday, then Tuesday, then a few more days, and then a couple more, and a couple more. Finally, the word. Quote, there's a widespread notion that tribal sovereignty and Indian treaties are legal, historical, practical, and correct terms, she wrote in the lead. Actually, sovereignty is sovereignty, and treaties are treaties. Nation to nation is between and among sovereigns, and the use of tribal or Indian on any modifiers both misleading and belittling. Suzanne framed the history of our country, not Indian country, mind you, but the United States, in a compact narrative illuminating the historical authority of treaties. And I say compact, I'm talking about 8,000 words. <laughs> Imagine reading 8,000 words on a cell phone. <laughs> but here's the thing. We're a digital publication, so we get to measure how people react to stories. We know exactly how they spend time on it. And because of that, we know that readers spent 8 minutes and 12 seconds on If You Don't Know History. It was the best read story of that week and of that month and one of the top stories of the entire year. All told, more than 100,000 people read Suzanne's essay on their cell phones or on Facebook, or even on uh, linking from other web pages. That had to be an aberration, right? That one story couldn't be that like for everything. So last spring, I got a press release from the New York State Museum in Albany about the return of sacred items. I thought, aha, a perfect assignment for Suzanne. A quick turn, it won't take long at all. She knew the issues already and she could just type away. No, no quick turn. 
About three weeks after deadline, I called Suzanne and asked about her progress. She said her computer had gone on the fritz and she was now writing the piece on her cell phone. I thought that was actually kind of cool, a cell phone story for our cell phone audience. And I was impressed with Suzanne's technical capability. A couple of weeks later, the piece arrived by email. The story had some of the press release elements, but not much. But it was the theft of a sacred item in the early 1900s. As she wrote, the current chapter in our long history of the pipe begins as a whodunit about an inside job. The pipe and written documents went through many unclean hands, at least seven named thieves, fences and auctioneers and authenticators, experts, and other enablers. And the good news, corn, pipers, pipe, corn planters pipe, being at home is such a time of sharing knowledge, wisdom, and courage, of allowing the outrages, triumphs, and visions to instruct, guide, and guard against all dangers of optimism about things that can and should and must be done. And remember, this whodunit was written on a mobile phone. And the word count? 13,000 words. <laughs> Once again, an extraordinary solid readership. And people read to the very end. I suspect older readers asked if we could publish the piece in printed form, and uh, I had a kick out of saying, I don't know, it's kind of long. <laughs> There's something else you should know about our data, and I think this is why it's so important every time Suzanne writes for us. Our readership is young. The number one demographic group in Indian country today is 25 to 34, and this has been a consistent factor since we relaunched. That means young people in Indian country are reading these stories. It's becoming part of a new narrative, one to me that's inspiring, not just about Suzanne Harjo's work, but about where we are in the current state of journalism. A few years ago, I visited Suzanne, and we talked about what Washington light was like and what journalism was like a few decades ago. I pulled out my pocket one ounce recorder and she laughed and said recording equipment had changed since she worked in, in radio. Then the world of journalism and Washington has changed too. Suzanne has been observing this city since 1962 when she was picked by the Cheyenne Arapaho Business Committee as the senior girl who along with one of the boys, a senior tribal member, earned their visit to Washington, D.C. I got really intrigued, she said, but when it came, came time to work, I went to New York instead. Then in the 1970s, there was another platform very similar to Indian Country Day now, one with innovation, and that was the American Indian Press Association. Reporters in Washington and contributors across the country collected the news of the day and shared it across a spacious channel. Native journalists covered the big stories of that time, the return of Blue Lake, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and the golden era of legislation the Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, and the Indian Finance Act. Suzanne started working with AFPA first as a correspondent from New York City. While at WBAI Radio, she interviewed a number of the people who were putting together the Trail of Broken Treaties in 1972, including Robert Burnett and Hank Adams, who had put together an Indian Rights Manifesto. She wrote, we knew what was being said publicly and what was happening privately. And it sounded to me like there were real provisions that had not been made for people in Washington. So it wasn't a surprise to hear that when they arrived in the city, they had no place to go or stay. Suzanne wrote that she was very pregnant at the time. And she went to Washington as soon as she learned about it when she went into the BIA building. And it quickly became an occupation of a federal building in the, in the mainstream press with rings of police surrounding the building. But, she wrote, we went in as press and our lives were there in part as press. You know, we were in part reporters, part producers, and in part just native people. We could do a whole program on just that event and the recordings that Suzanne and Frank Rajo, Harjo, and Frank Harjo uh, tape recordings, I hope they're one day found and preserved. Well, one story from that event 
As she crossed a police line with radio equipment in hand, a sort of war zone moment, quote, all over the BIA building, people were preparing for a battle and not knowing if there would be an attack. And then people were getting a little crazy inside. There were electric traps, there were Molotov cocktails. And at one point, Russell Means picked up a microphone and said they were going to blow the building. We were all really surprised by that, and so we ran downstairs. I kind of waddled because I was very pregnant, Harjo said. We all got downstairs just in time to see Russell Means light this long fuse and say it's a good time, day to die. But a couple of leaders, including Oren Lyons, shouted bullshit. <laughs> and, and quickly snuffed the fuse out. <laughs> On a practical note, Suzanne moved for the rest of the incident to stay at nights at the National Press Building. She said, they had a very nice couch. <laughs> the first news director of the American Indian Press Association was Richard LaCourse, the great Yakima journalist. But he was uh, being worn out by working in Washington and wanted to move west. So they came up with a scheme where he would move to Albuquerque and hire Suzanne as his replacement to run the news operation. Richard's timeline was all of instant. He was leaving in two weeks, and to Richard's surprise, Suzanne said yes. In New York City, Frank had just been in, in the hospital because a car ran a red light and plowed into his. He saw it coming and protected our son with his body, she recalled. I went to the hospital to break the news to my husband, who was shocked and furious. I gave my two-week notice to WBAI. Friends from the station helped us give away floors, four floors of stuff and moved us and my husband, who is in hip to tow cast to Washington, D.C., in one U-Haul type truck and a caravan of cars. That began Suzanne's Washington stay. It was an extraordinary time for a journalist. BIA Commissioner Louis Bruce was, had a team known as the Cuts and Jammer Kids because they were young. They brought new ideas, energy, and chaos into the Interior Department bureaucracy. Not only did they give good interviews, she wrote, but they gave us GTRs, government travel requests. And with these chits, you could fly away. And that's how the Indian press got around. In a way, she said, the Nixon administration and Louis Bruce financed the movements, the people, and whether you were strictly speaking as a journalist or whether you were an activist. Moving to Washington also meant direct interaction with the Washington football franchise. At a game where Suzanne and her husband were called the R word, folks began to touch their hair. I know others today will tell this story in detail, but others told this story in detail, but I wanted to connect it to journalism. Mascots, and especially the derogatory team name, is something that Suzanne has been writing about for more than a half century. And the rude and horrible touching of hair continues to be a thing. Suzanne began this year, January 1st, with an essay detailing how this is a modern expression of racism. She wrote, hair is part of our identity, culture, religion of many indigenous peoples. It's a source of pride, not only for the individual wearing long or specially styled hair, but for entire families, societies, and nations. I say this in a very personal way, as an observer of our ways and times. I am the mother of a son who once could sit on his hair. He is now the father of two sons, my dear grandsons, eight and 10, who wear their hair in thick braids and well past their braids. Like Mary Catherine, I'm cognizant of the clocks, so I'm skipping forward. Um, when I sat down to write this, uh, we were given instructions to write 2,500 words, and um, I ignored that, and at 4,000 decided. <laughs> but I want to conclude with this. So much of the technology has changed since Suzanne started writing, but what has not changed is her passion for informing Native people about our world, our history, and how we fit into a global narrative. I once heard Suzanne have a conversation with an editor who was afraid of editing her, and uh, he was worried about the give and take of editing. Suzanne told him not to worry, this is the story. And the point is to make the story better. And that's true for our story too. 
Thank you, Suzanne. I'd like to thank our, our panel for also for enlightening us about so much and particularly about some of the, the lesser known history of our director here at NMAI.